serving New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut. You're watching Channel 9, WWOR-TV. The following is one of the best of the Joe Franklin shows, which was recorded earlier this year. Good morning. Something really different today and very exciting for me. A special presentation prepared a short while ago and soon to be a weekly series on your television screen. A preview of Joe Franklin's Hollywood Memories. Enjoy. Okay, my friends, starting off the uh, festivities or the festivities will be my idol, Bing Crosby, the old groaner when he was uh, the young groaner, maybe about a half century ago. And this is what I mean. Let's watch. Here in your arms, I can't remain. Oh, let me kiss you once again. King of Sing almost a half century ago, and let me tell you something, that uh, his autobiography, Bing's autobiography, was called Call Me Lucky, but if anybody was lucky, it was me, because I was one of the last to chat with the great man on TV. Th there are no words. It had to be, uh, and will forever remain, one of the milestones, if not the milestone, of my career, not only in the golden dozen, but in the golden two or three, in my recollection, in my reminiscence, had to be my interview with the master. Bing Crosby. I was on a memory lane cruise. I took some old timers on a cruise and I got to give you one name. He's no longer with us, sadly, but he always spoke about you and the Hotel Belvedere. Yeah. Sid Gary. What Sid is... Gary, the master of the double talk. Did you know him? He was, on, uh, he was one of my closest friends. You know, he, he was really the fellow that started double talk. Before. And he was the best. Right. The greatest, because he had a real professorial appearance. He dressed very, looked like he's going down to Wall Street or somewhere. Right. And he'd get a total stranger, like there used to be a house detective at the Belvedere Hotel. He was an Irishman, wore a green derby. I'll give you an idea. And he was a real stolid sort of an Irishman. And Sid Gary... Anytime we come in from a cafe or a restaurant late at night, he'd get this guy and give him about a 15-minute routine of double talk, and the guy didn't understand the word of it, but he'd just keep yes and Sid, yes, Mr. Gary, and Sid would say, you know, on the Prowling time, there's a Gadarin side there, and you get the Prowling, and the reason against the Prowling side, the guy said, mm -hmm, mm-hmm, 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 and Sid was a great singer, did you know that? He was a good singer. He had his Big own... boys, big, yeah. strong, he'd do the road to Mandalay, and... Those big, epic kind of songs. He was a baritone. Brother, spare me a dime. Right. Did you ever hear him sing that? Sure. Bing, there was once a battle of the baritones on the radio. You opposite Russ Columbo. Yeah. Now, and Valley was in there somewhere, wasn't Valley, he? Valley. Well, there was I a think big, he ran third. There was a big song, Crosby. <laughs> but it was a photo between Russ and I. Just a wild, hypothetical and, thought. Yeah, uh, just a pseudo had, feud that they cooked. Had, uh, had Russ Columbo lived? Yeah. Had he lived? Would he have uh, been as popular? Great star. I tell you, he was a handsome guy. Right. And he had a warm, ingratiating personality. And he could sing. And he was a good musician. He played wonderful violin, you know. Right. And I think if he'd have lived, he'd have been a big romantic star. The time I knew him the best, we worked together in a band at the Coconut Grove in Los Angeles, the Gus Arnheim band. And we sang some duets. We sang in quintets with the rhythm boys. And uh, we were great pals. And he was going with Carol Lombard. You remember her? Of course. Beautiful woman and a great personality. And she was crazy about it. They would have been married, I'm sure, if he hadn't been killed. Sad, mysterious uh, death. Well, it was, I know the facts, and they're probably a little gruesome. We wouldn't want to repeat them here. But his mother, it was an Italian family, and he had three older brothers. And she had a serious heart condition. And they never told her that he'd been killed. 
they just wrote letters from London. They had London mail sent from Italy and said he was on tour. Right. And she died a year and a half later without ever knowing that he'd been killed because they were sure if she had been told, she'd have died immediately. But she lived on maybe 18, 20 months mm. before. Uh, then he's been there. They, they knew they didn't have My. to consider the deception continued any longer. My guest is Long the... That was a sad story. My guest, ladies and gentlemen, is the man who has sold more records than anybody else, more hit movies. Now, that somebody, may be a fiction about the records, uh, Joe. You can't... You think the, you Beatles, know, well, you think know, the, the Beatles came close? I think they must sell more, yeah. When you think of... These days, uh, there's so many more record buyers, so many more people have playback machines and all those stereo sets. In those days, gee, if you got a record to sell 100,000, you were having a big sale mm -hmm. way back there, you know? So I don't see how that could be true, but uh, the figures are put out by the, the record companies. I'll have to check that over and see if I got paid on all those royalties. Yeah. <laughs> Hard to believe if they sold 400 million records. I didn't get that much money, Joe. Being the... Uh, but I'm glad to get anything, you know. You did fair. You did fair. The, the fellows who impersonated you in vaudeville, including Sid Gary, and, and when they would do that boo 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 yeah. I, I used to wonder, did you ever really... Like they say, like, Cary Grant never said uh, Judy, 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 and yeah. Betty Davis never said this, and Humphrey Bogart never said, all right, Louie, drop the gun. Uh, people have asked me, because I'm supposed to be somewhat an authority, did Bing Crosby ever really go boo, 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 when he sang? Yes, there's a couple of records, uh, I think, in Learn to Croon, from a picture called College Humor. Was that on purpose or because... No, it was considered very classy. Then, <laughs> you know, from boo, 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 they went to vo, do, di, o, and then right. hi, di, ho, and then ha, cha, cha, and then hey, hey. But now, these scat singers now, Joe, are fantastic. You take Ella Fitzgerald, Mel Torme, Cleo Lane, they take a scat chorus now. It's light years ahead of anything I ever did, because I just boo boo booed when I couldn't remember the words, you know? But did you ever turn down, did you ever reject, let's say, ever turn down a song or a movie or any project that, not that you regretted it later on, but something that you, you could have had, but it turned well, out... I can think of a song that's pertinent. Uh, I, I did a picture called She Loves Me Not. Right. And we had a song in there called Love and Bloom, and I didn't like it. Didn't like it. I would sang it in the picture, but I, I just uh, kind of did a record and threw it away, and it wound up Jack Benny's theme song. Uh, now nobody connects me with the song at all, and, and uh, it's become his, or was his, you know. i got to give you his album later on today. He's your number one fan after me. Steve Mason, who puts out these albums of Crosby Sings Crosby, and, let's and see what Columbo. he sings. Ramona, I hear the mission bells above. Continue. I could tell the world how to smile. I could be lonely if I had you. Call me darling. Call me darling, call me that. You came to me from out of nowhere. When April showers, when bing, 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 da da. First you put your two knees close up tight, and then you wiggle to the left, and then you wiggle to the right. Where the blue of the night meets the gold of the day. Oh, how did this get in here? A good man is hard to find. Yeah. A good man is hard to find. You often get the other kind. And just when you think that your man is great, you find that he's a think, and then you haul your friend. You made that up. I threw in that line, yeah. <laughs> find that he's a think, and then you haul your friend. One more chance to prove it to alone that I fear for. It was a lucky April shower. It was the most convenient door. I found a million dollar baby in a five and ten cent store. Now, this is Russ's song. I can't believe it. You can, now, you call it madness. And I call it love. I don't remember the first part of it. Then this was Alice Faye's great song. I don't know why I love you like I do. I don't know why, but I do. Great song. This, I'm gonna, I'm I cannot... I'm going to put some of those back in the medley. That, that pairing of you and Hope, and, of course, Dorothy L'Amour made it a trio. Yeah. And how did that start? That started well, to... Hope uh, had his own radio show, and I did. And he started... We were old pals from the Friars Club, and we right. played the Capitol Theater together. And it, I knew him very well. He started kidding me about my... I was a little ample in the waist in those days, and he called me a pot, you know, how did you... Only pot I ever saw had a, didn't have a rainbow over it, stuff like that. Right. And he, then I'd kid him about his, his nose and about his bad jokes, and it got to be kind of a pseudo-feud, you know, like Winchell had with... Uh, was it Bernie? Ben Winchell? Bernie. Ben yeah, Bernie. and then there was a feud, Fred Allen and... Uh, Jack Benny. Jack Benny. Make-believe. Make-believe. Yeah, they were bosom pals, and so were Bob. And I and the feud developed and got funny. And then I was on his show, and we'd do the same humor, and he was on mine, the same thing. And then finally, somebody at the studio, I think it was Buddy De Silva, who was the head of Paramount then. Right. He said, why don't we put these two guys together? And uh, they got Frank Hartman and uh, Don Hartman and Frank Butler to write. Uh, their first one was Road to Singapore. They figured they'd try it once. That's right. It looked like a one-time shot. And uh, we had lived a lot, and we had directors who were very tolerant, uh, Dave Butler and uh, guys like that, Victor Schertzinger, just let us do anything we wanted. And... Uh, the writers used to come on the set, and we'd say, if you 
Here a line that's yours, holler bingo, and then we go right back to work on you. That was a lucrative celluloid road. Very good. I think we met eight, seven, or eight of them. Could there be a road to yesteryear or a road to nostalgia? I wasn't talking about one road to tomorrow, but you, you know, Joe, two old gaffers like us, we can't chase the chicks anymore. No, too old. We can't have a rivalry over the leading lady. I mean, Nobody the chicks believe are too, it. You're too young. And the chicks would get away. We wouldn't be able to catch them anyhow. Bing told me something during our interview that I never knew. He told me that his mother, his beloved mom, never called him Bing. Didn't even like the sound of that uh, nickname, Bing. She only addressed him by his given name of Harry. And when you think about Bing Crosby, how can you not think about his buddy, his road to everywhere pal, Bob Hope. One of my favorite Bob Hope lines uh, that Bob delivered on my program was when he said, Bing Crosby never pays income taxes. He just calls up the Treasury and asks them casually, how much money do you need today? I'll be right back with more good friends. Stay with me because I'm just getting warmed up and I'm having a good time. Thank you.